Welcome to ESVN, the Emma Sports Vigeland Network Show. My name is Emma Vigeland. Folks, you know what to do. Subscribe to ESVN, youtube.com slash ESVN show. Rate us five stars on Apple and Spotify. Like this stream gets it into the algorithm. And say hello to Bradley Alsop, who has lost his voice. Hello, everyone. Sounding <laughs> raspy over I, there. I'm, I'm not fit for an audio medium today. You sound better than you did this morning. Yeah, maybe. I couldn't really talk this morning. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. It's, you're, it's, uh, you're in a better situation. Yeah, maybe after I looked at the eclipse. Perhaps, I know. We did go and try to look at the eclipse through our phones because I did not have any of those special glasses. Um, and, uh, you know, down here in downtown Brooklyn, there were a lot of people that had them, and I really anticipated that we, when we went to the area where everyone was looking, that someone would be like, hey, here, take these glasses, try them out, look at the eclipse, and no one offered them. I mean, one person did, one very nice person, but that person uh, had seen the show. So, it, like, no, no person unfamiliar with our work did an act of kindness to the random strangers looking for glasses. To be fair, we didn't ask. And I could have asked those children and maybe forced them and said, hey, I'm an adult. You got to give me your glass. Give me your lunch money. Listen here, boy. Yes. Give me those glasses. But uh, alas, I just, I, I didn't really think to to take that, uh, you know, steal from a child. So we... What was, uh, what was missing was a generosity of spirit. We got... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know what you're doing. It was I. I. Uh, it's hard to do Jordan Peterson. Oh when yes, I, when I, yes, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, when I'm dealing with other voice issues. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's truly uh, truly incredible. Um, the the, I don't know. Uh, the level of like hysteria, hysteria, pop about culture, it. hysteria, yeah. almost for like a you know celestial event. Totally, uh, but it has passed, and we have survived. Uh, and I did so the the nice man that let me look for a second in his glasses. I did get to we did get to see a little bit. You saw a bit, which was yeah, nice. yeah, it's cool. Um, let's just get right into it here because this is uh we we had a a pretty big sports weekend. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it as we kind of barreled towards the NBA and NHL playoffs and. Right now, um, the Eastern Conference in the NHL, the wild card, is completely up for grabs. Uh, it's been a race and, and between a few teams, a race to the bottom where <laughs> you have some teams that like seemingly don't even want to... to uh, it feels like they don't want... Um, to uh, actually get through into the wild card, but then you have teams like the Pittsburgh Penguins that are absolutely sprinting on the back of uh, one guy, Sidney Crosby, who's just carrying that entire team into the playoffs. Um, the ageless wonder. Totally. I mean, he just is an incredible... I mean, he's the true definition of an MVP candidate in my book, most valuable to his team. If the Penguins, with that roster, make the playoffs, and he is... It'll be completely because of one guy. And that's what's incredible about the the Pittsburgh Penguins and really about Sidney Crosby in particular. Um, I can't believe that the New York Islanders are currently in a playoff spot. That seems to defy logic, but they've been winning a lot, trying to get themselves into the playoffs. Um, and we'll talk about the NBA actually in a little bit and how I, you know, I think people should be very concerned about the Milwaukee Bucks. But um, let's start with college basketball and this like really historic moment in women's sports that we're witnessing right now the south carolina gamecocks are the national champions uh for college basketball for women's college basketball and they defeated the uh they defeated iowa and the caitlin clarks <laughs> 87 to 75 uh that makes them undefeated on the season. And this is the second time in three years that Dawn Staley has won the national championship. She has gone 109 and three in her three years at South Carolina. Literally, she's only lost three times. The, uh, the, the difference in, in physicality and skill level outside of Caitlin Clark was evident from the beginning of this game Clark popped off for 18 points and, you know, she can shoot from space, but she was basically the entire team. And once they clamped down on her, um, 
you know, Tessa Johnson, who's a freshman, was awesome. She had 19 points, and she started to settle in. Cardoso also started to settle in. She's going to be a top five pick, most likely, in the WNBA draft, which is going to be held in Brooklyn pretty recent and pretty soon. Clark will be the first next, overall pick next Monday. Actually. Oh, it's next Monday. It's kind of it's kind of remarkable how quick of a turnaround wow. it is for these these women after the tournament. But yeah, mm-hmm. so as you said, yeah, like you know. Caitlin Clark and and a, and a number of other a number of other uh, you know Camilla as you said Camilla Cardoso as well basically go from the biggest game of their careers right into like starting their future of yeah them. and then presumably I guess also whoever's you know a senior or whatever are also then graduating from college too so it's like a very you know yes very uh, formative and kind of like overwhelming. Uh, time in their lives totally all within quick success all events with a quick within quick succession of one another and they've they've risen to the challenge i mentioned just how evident the dis the size disadvantage was when south carolina was was uh next to the iowa players on the floor um again you know outside of caitlin clark shooting there really was no advantage that iowa had against south carolina south carolina they were just absolutely relentless in terms of rebounding offensive and defensive rebounding and that i think was what made their size advantage so apparent and especially in the second half when they locked down on defense um raven johnson let's be real she didn't have she had an end to her year last year in a way that you know i know that she was pretty open about how devastating that was because she i think was maybe was she on caitlin clark in that loss last year there was there was a moment i think where um if i'm not mistaken that was memorable that that in the final four loss to uh, iowa clark like waved off raven johnson from defending her but then as you were as you're alluding to last night or yesterday afternoon um Johnson was basically almost on her like one on one for the majority of the game. And, like, not for re- that first oh, not quarter for the first when that's when Caitlin Clark put up eighteen like, points and everyone first... was freaking out. Like out that's like a... LeBron James tweeting, right. you know, you can't hate on this girl's game. Right. But then she got locked up basically and was not very efficient. And I don't put that on her, honestly, because she needs to score it, like that or they're not going to have a shot in, in hell. Right. But uh, she was not very efficient for the rest of the game, and that was in, in large part due to Raven Johnson. It was kind of – I think the the strategy was smart and sound that basically walling off, not just like – like like going at the point of attack very, very early on while Clark was bringing up the ball, but also um, – while not making her comfortable around the perimeter, also denying her passing lane, so she was like really bottled up, which led to some errant passes and to some turnovers. So like they kind of like they used a bit of Clark's aggressiveness against her, which I think was like the right thing to do, which is sort of take away her bread and butter of the of the long range shot. And then when she gets into more drive and kick opportunities, not giving her the ability to pass. Yeah, I mean, and her passing also we're 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 making it we're we're doing what everyone hates and we're making the South Carolina win about Caitlin Clark. I understand that. So I want to put her. It's my fault. I've been, I've kept bringing her up. I want to put her aside for for just no, a second. No, I, I hear you. Though. And let's I, I play. You. Yeah, let's play this. Let's play this. Uh, uh, the 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 aftermath here. This is you know uh, some of the South Carolina players speaking here um, about their coach, about Don Staley. I believe uh, this is uh, Cardoso, and um, well, we'll see. Let's hear. Let's hear these uh, South Carolina players speaking about how Staley has meant so much to them. One second. Go, you mean D done state? <laughs> um, it means a lot just to play, um, just to learn from her. I mean, she's she's like a mom. I, I, I mean, I don't know. Like I go to her about everything. I mean, I could I could joke around with her. I could you know do anything. Just anything. She's like a mom, or like a home away from home. It's a home away from home feeling, and there's no better way to have a coach like her and be so comfortable around her. And I just. You know, I take pride into what she do for us on and off the court, not just with basketball. So, Camilla? Yeah, I agree with Ray. I feel like, especially me, I'm international, so I don't have my family here. And she's just like a family for me, a family from my home. And I'm just so thankful to have her as a coach. Aww. Tahina? <laughs> Man, um, 
she's so important to have in people's lives, man. She's she's amazing. Um, you know, God has put her in my life, and she's impacted it so much, not only me, but my family. Um, she changes lives for the better. Um, I wish you guys could experience that and just how much she's helped me as a player and as a woman. And she's just amazing, man. It's a blessing, and just playing for her, it's so much fun, and people just love playing for her. And, you know, people want, would run through brick walls for her. And to, to be able to have a coach like that, it's, it's unmatched. And we're all just really blessed to have someone like her in our corner. And um, she just impacted our lives for the better. She really is a record-breaking coach in that way. I've said, I said this earlier, but the, she's the first black coach to win three NCAA Division I championships. And she went 109-3 and three in three years at South Carolina, two championships on top of that. Um, I mean, I, 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 you really see how these women feel, young women, feel uh, that Staley has their back, fosters an environment where they can be themselves and be great at the same time, and treats their, the, the players that she coaches with um, a lot of respect and allows them to just play their game and be themselves in that way. Um, and she also just, I think, creates, and, and I haven't watched a ton of South Carolina basketball, but in this tournament, what I've observed, um, in incredible, incredible defensive intensity for her players um, and just makes them, I, I think, clearly the best versions of themselves. And what a run to start her three-year career with South Carolina as a coach. Yeah, and I think what you saw there very clearly was not just like a a talent disparity between South Carolina and Iowa in terms of how, you know, top heavy Huge. the Iowa roster was relative to um the South Carolina roster, but also sort of like a team like a team building or like a team philosophy perspective as well, because seeing that those that starting five work together and again, I say this as I say this not to diminish or minimize Caitlin Clark's performance. I just more mean the difference of watching this Iowa team relative to the South Carolina team is like, yes, you could argue that the offense and kind of the identity was funneled through Camila Cardozo, which like makes sense to a degree. She's six foot seven. She has incredible touch around the basket. She's a rebounding machine. But everything else was everything else, and all the people around her. Raven Johnson is a freshman if i'm not mistaken like some of these players who were making who were ab were, oh, sorry raven johnson was not the other johnson tessa johnson tessa was johnson's a, friend, a, freshman. a freshman she's the one that put up 19 right right yeah. so so like there are there are many young young women on this team who are incredibly impactful throughout the whole game and honestly being in that starting five or even being six or seven this is truly nothing against iowa i, I think it's truly just a testament to staley's recruiting and staley's coaching that like a few of the starters on Iowa's team probably would have trouble making a South Carolina rotation in basketball. And even to, even like, you know, Stolke, Stolke on Iowa played really admirably against Cardozo. The issue yeah. is, while Stolke in a, in a number of other situations, she's six foot two, she would still have some sort of height and, height and, height and athleticism advantage against some other um bigs or other kind of uh stretch fours or fives but not against cardozo who's five inches taller than her like yeah the the athleticism and and gameplay and skill disparity outside of caitlin clark was very clear um once kind of south carolina's team basketball started to become very apparent and they got past as you said that sort of um Punch in the mouth type of run that Iowa went on immediately as the game started. That as, as soon as things started to stabilize, that's when kind of South Carolina both took control of the game and also took control. I think of like the pace and the tempo. They sort of just like constricted Iowa. Yeah, and didn't that's... allow that like it didn't allow any of the um, sets or like the flow of the game yes. to come to Iowa's offense. It right, just all became very difficult and very strained. And 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 they also overcame um, foul trouble in the first half. Like their starters were in foul trouble ashton watkins yeah, right, in particular right, right, i think right. she sat fairly early um and so that is I, that is part of why uh uh to tessa johnson was playing so often as a freshman as well um and yeah i mean it it, it was it was 
it was uh, increasingly apparent as the game went on because I just kept uh, waiting for South Carolina to take over or for uh, the frenzied pace that Iowa was playing with to kind of come to a grinding halt. Because the other thing that needs to be noted is, is that because I think Iowa was so aware that they're not deep at all, they could barely take their starters off the floor. I mean, right. did did Caitlin Clark sit the entire game? I'm not sure, but if she did, it was for a very brief amount of time because as some people... In the, she looked really tired. Yeah, yeah, some people in the YouTube chat were alluding. She was absolutely... You, you could tell she was gas towards the end. Well, I, mean, how could I saw her be? face was red. And, right. uh, you know, you were, as someone who, uh, when they work out, it gets a pretty red face. It's, it's like, I know that because I'm not in her shape. limit, sort of. Yes. All, and also, as you said, yes. absolutely no no shame in that. You're on you're running, you're on the court in the biggest game of your life for almost an hour. Like, um, the other thing I wanted to mention about South Carolina, which I thought was so incredible, which I wasn't aware of. Um, so Aaliyah Boston, um, who was the first overall pick in the WNBA draft this past season, um, on the Indiana Fever now. She was in, in uh, for the halftime... Future teammate of Caitlin yes, Clark. Yes, for the, yes. They're going to take her first purposes, overall, yeah. Which will be kind of a, a, fun, a fun link up there. Um, she was one of the starting five um, for Don Staley that did not return after last season. Right. And when they went 36-1 and one and lost to Iowa in the Final Four. So... Many people, I think, who have been watching this W this this uh, women's college women's college basketball season from the beginning, were not expecting nearly as formidable of a South Carolina team, and yet this was the team after that much turnover and that much attrition to their roster, went undefeated in the regular season and went all the way through the tournament yeah. without a loss. Yeah. So I think beyond a testament to just how phenomenal and how special of a coach Don Staley is, I also think. It's so impressive and so amazingly impressive the South Carolina staff of scouting talent and just um, maximizing the potential of all of the talent that they have, even after losing so much. Yeah, and and let's just now turn to to Clark. We've we've danced around it a lot, but I mean, she, she still played so well though. She, it was still so sick. Look, okay, so there's so much to be said here. I think let's let's pull up uh, what Don Staley had to say about Caitlin Clark after. Uh, Iowa lost to the undefeated um, South Carolina Gamecocks here where they got their revenge for last year. And this is the perspective, along with LeBron James, basically saying, like, if you don't like this this girl's game, you're a hater for, for the most part. This is where I kind of want to orient things towards because um, I think there are a ton of valid criticisms in the way that she is getting an outsized spotlight. But there also is this undeniable fact articulated here by Don Staley. I want to say one more thing. I, 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 I really would just like to say that um, I, I have to congratulate Iowa on an incredible season. Awesome. Awesome. And I, I want to personally thank Caitlin Clark for lifting up our sport. Her, she carried a she carried a heavy load for our sport, and it just is not going to stop here on the collegiate tour. But when she is the number one pick in the WNBA draft, she's going to she's going to lift that league up as well. So, so Caitlin Clark, if you're out there, you are one of the goats of our games. That we appreciate you. Thank you, Coach. So that's, exa that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And what a classy thing to say. Um, and I still think that there should be more coverage about South Carolina and their dominance. But, you know, an undefeated season and a clearly dominant program for the past three years, it's not necessarily the sexiest story. So there's that part. Um, but there's also the part that Caitlin Clark is a white girl. And... She is seen uh, seen as marketable by a lot of corporate interests that she already has her own State Farm commercial. ESPN was showing her every chance that they absolutely could to the point where, you know, there are a lot of rightful complaints about that. I mean, where is the same kind of coverage for these other incredibly talented players on South Carolina, like Camila Cardoso, who's going to be a top pick in uh, the WNBA draft as well, and other players within college basketball that just don't get the same attention. Well, also, I, I, another thing to your point, Emma, too, I also think that there was this like kind of pernicious dynamic that unfortunately 
I think sort of fell on Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese to have to sort of like adjudicate as student athletes basically being pitted against each other as if they had this like, you know, extreme extreme animosity between one another, extreme like kind of rivalry between one another, which by the way is usually like seen as not only like incredibly beneficial to a sport narratively, but also in the in the men's game is kind of considered just part and parcel of what you're doing. Well, it's we talked really... about that last year. We talked about that last year too, where they were pit, that people love to pit women against each other and right? sort of make it as if like, Oh, like she did the hand thing. She did the ring thing like that. Like there's so much animosity and... where Angel Reese actually said, she was like, we're competitors. We're competing. Well, she was mocking what Caitlin Clark had been right, doing to people, right. the rest of the people, the other tour, the rest of the tournament, right? Which is part of it. I, I just want to make the second yeah. point because I'm I'm giving all the caveats, right? That was also heavily racialized, where it's like, sure. oh, this black 100%. girl is is victimizing this other white girl. This is all completely valid and true. However, please don't let it overshadow this kind of the what this girl actually, this young woman, this kind of player that she is. I mean. I know she wasn't efficient and people are going to pick apart her numbers, right? Like she scored 30, but it was like, you know, she didn't she didn't shoot that well for the rest of the game after she scored 18 in that first quarter. The uh, Iowa Stolke is a good player. Everybody else, I mean, let's be real here. Okay, there was no Kaylin Clark was the only player that outmatched any of those players on South Carolina and it wasn't close. You could see it from the jump. Physically South Carolina was more dominant more athletically dominant, bigger in size, and it reflected in the rebounds. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I saw the, the numbers here on some of the rebounds. Let me just try to find that. Okay, here we go. Uh, the, to the total here was a 51 to 29 total rebounding differential. 18 to 7 on offense. I was going to say the offensive rebounding disparity was like even just watching it without knowing the numbers, it was pretty extraordinary. Totally. Could, Cardozo could just get every single one just by virtue of being able to reach over Stolke. So she was just forced to carry the team on her back, which right. led to some inefficiencies. So I, but I find that argument to be pretty ridiculous. And additionally, she was gassed, as we said earlier, because yep. she played the entire game. And she doesn't sit. And so, right, right. like, I, I, there's a lot of conversation about Caitlin Clark that surrounds her but that is stuff that is largely out of her control. I was going to say, right. It's not, it's not within her. It's not a lot of the, a lot of those things that are, we are seeing, I think is right. And rightfully so as pernicious, they're not stemming from Caitlin Clark directly. They're stemming from how Caitlin Clark is now as a result, which is inevitable when you become a public figure like this, especially as an athlete, how she is ultimately then used to that effect to whatever effect it is by, you know, by pundits, by the media, by broadcast teams, but that which then becomes not just Caitlin Clark the person, but almost Caitlin Clark like the like the idea almost like what does what does she represent? Yeah, and she's not really as you said, she's not really responsible, nor can she fully be for how people use her perception in that way. Yeah, I mean her she's it's in it's in the um she's Iowa's all time leading scorer. Okay. She uh, has the most 30-point games by any man or woman in Division One in the past 25 seasons. Um, she had a 40-point triple-double last year with the Elite Eight, which um, I think was a record-breaking performance in and of itself. Uh, she is the leading scorer in the Big Ten. Um, I, I'm, I'm just trying to find all of her records here. She's she passed Kelsey Plum for yes. most points of all time by a by a woman uh, in in D1 basketball, and also passed um, Pistol Pete Maravich for his all time points record amongst men and women's college basketball. Right. So, she is an absolute legend. It, I also think that this would be slightly different if this elevation of her was coming and it wasn't deserved. Yep. Like. I, I and don't get me wrong. I, I I'm I'm not I'm saying that with the complete understanding that like how some of this has definitely been unfair or obscuring to athletes like Angel Rees or some of these women in South Carolina or even like Juju Watkins and USC or Paige Beckers on um, UConn. But it's not as if all of this chatter was so for, is for who might be seen as somebody as like a mediocre player. She's actually a like, remarkable, extraordinary talent. And she has changed with all of that baggage, right? With all of, not that baggage, but with all the baggage thrust upon right. her, she has changed the women's game forever, which is what 
was recognized there totally. by Don Staley. Last year, um, the uh, Iowa LSU final had 9.9 .9 million viewers, which is was at the time the most ever watched college basketball game. It only grew more this year in the Elite Eight uh, when it was LSU versus uh, Iowa, 12.3 million viewers. The uh, UConn-Iowa game, 14.2 million viewers. So it just kept growing and growing, and we still don't have the final numbers on on this game. But she literally, um, the, 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 this, uh, this uh, Iowa-UConn game, ESPN in their write-up said it was their most watched basketball broadcast ever passing game seven of the 2018 nba eastern conference finals caitlin clark is an is is drawing so much attention to women's sports in a way that like i i i feel like all of the criticism and the the di the, the racial dynamics at play here based on advertisers and the way that the that 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 sports media is responding to her a hundred percent valid but wow has she been incredibly impactful in a positive way for women's athletes everywhere and i'm seeing more attention on the women's tournaments in hockey as well which is also a really exciting uh game to watch this is a watershed moment and i think it's also going to be huge for the wmba which can hopefully expand because they don't have enough teams to accommodate all these great women i also think this totally goes to show which is not something revolutionary and don't get me wrong i certainly like i'm not i don't want to act as if i have not been complicit in this myself where i've sort of spent much more time focused on the men's basketball tournament rather than the women's and and, and that goes for many different sports right but I'm so grateful for this because it also just gives lie to this idea that like somehow, some way, some sort of talent deficit or some sort of storyline or narrative deficit exists between men's and women's sports. Everyone I think would agree with me when I say this that there's no question that from a narrative perspective and also even in some regards from a quality of basketball perspective, this was the better tournament. Absolutely. This was the more exciting tournament. Let me make this point before I forget. It was the more exciting tournament, and it's for a reason that's not also not the best because it's the the women's basketball players have fewer rights than than yeah oh than, yeah because right. the best uh, players in college basketball who aren't even going to by the way college anymore they're going to the G League or they're going to play internationally right. where they can get paid and yep. I think that's good for them but if you're a great player in college basketball I mean these guys at the UConn they're one and done. Oh yeah. What yeah. allows these college games and it it it's it shouldn't be this way, but they should be getting paid if they still want to make the rules for the WNBA that you have to be 21 or older to be eligible to enter into the draft. Um it allows these rivalries to build up over multiple years. Right. Like the fact that there was a, an Angel Reese Caitlin Clark matchup was a huge part of the draw because this is like old school rivalry stuff where they get to have a rematch now we got to see it again whereas as you said with some of these very much so in the now the one and done but also you know g league ignite international play as you were alluding to it's not just that we would maybe only see a rivalry or so-called rivalry once between two one and done players in the men's league with some of these guys as you're saying who are coming into the draft we would maybe never see it at all because these guys are either playing pro semi-professionally or they're playing in France or Greece or wherever they're playing. Yeah. Like, so to your point, it's certainly like a kind of product of like the imbalance between, you know, the opportunities that these women are afforded. But the one, I think amazing thing that I hope only breeds more attention and breeds more, um, lively livelihood into, uh, this uh, into people communally watching women's basketball, giving it the same purchase as men's basketball, is seeing how fantastic this product can be. And also, one thing I really do want to mention is that what I appreciated so much about, and this is coming from somebody who, well, listen, I know they're annoying sometimes. I always, I actually do like still to this day get a kick for the most part out of the inside the NBA guys, but. There was something incredibly refreshing about seeing four or five women at the broadcast booth for the for the uh, quarter breaks and the halftime break who were incredibly literate, incredibly well-versed in the game of women's basketball, in basketball at period, and who very clearly had so much passion for the game that they were watching and were and, and in a broadcast where I was actually learning stuff. 
Yeah. I was actually like, I was, it was actually educational. It wasn't just like, you know, Kenny Smith and Charles Barkley running to the border and getting like popcorn dropped on them, which like has its own value in its own no, way. No, I'm so I, sick of it. It doesn't have any value I, anymore. I, <laughs> I am so sick of but it. But I appreciated so much just these voices where I was like, I might not be super familiar with all of them, but they were incre- L. Duncan, Chine Ogumwike, uh, and a few others were just so. I was just so impressed by that. I, I, I all I want is more of this. All yeah. I want is for us to be able to be. We are lucky to be in a position where now, you know, better late than never. But now I think we can actually get a product that is worth and is that that rises to and, and that women's basketball deserves which they did not did not and have not gotten for so long totally agree totally agree um well before uh we move on to professional sports here um i mean what do you think is going to happen tonight i think we talked about this a little bit before uh the break but yeah, i mean so i'm with before you. we went on air i think uconn's gonna smoke them yeah i'm with you because the speaking of in terms of players coming back i was sort of surprised that donovan clinkin decided to come back to uconn because he was right still, he's not one and done i, I forgot he's a sophomore because yeah. he was still so dominant right even last year when they won obviously but i think this is just not an ideal matchup for someone like zach Eady because Eady on purdue while he has a height advantage over Klingon, Klingon is just a much more i would say physical and kind of like um yeah, he's physical and he's also he looks for contact. Like he's trying to to draw a foul and and a better athlete by oh totally. I mean, Edie's. I said you know the the broadcasters were saying Edie's a tree and he is a tree. He's, but 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 that's exactly what he is. He's, he's not, not as a guy fast that as Klingon. His he's strides not as, are not right. going to be something that blows you away in the way that when you see Klingon on the floor, you're like, okay, that's a different athlete for that size. He's quicker on his feet. Yeah. He he has he has t- he has similar if not better touch I would say than Edie with a, 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 around the basket. So and and as I was just and I think just so importantly is like DJ Burns the NC State will, will always play physical, but he unfortunately was seven inches shorter than or or five or seven, five to seven inches shorter than Edie. Yeah, Klingon makes up a little bit of that difference and is like very athletic, very aggressive, tenacious, like wanting to kind of bury his shoulder into guys like it's going to exhaust Edie in some capacity yeah and so. i mean the what is the what purdue's answer for for stefan castle and his ability to score so quickly seems like i don't really know if they're going to be able to keep up and that's the other difficulty right is that if if there's any sort of real pressure put on Klingon to kind of assist Edie in that regard you kick it out to Castle, and then where does it go from there? Yeah, I, I, I just, you know, I think Purdue showed a lot of their weaknesses um, in their game against NC State. The fact that maybe they're not the best team scoring um, is going to be difficult when you have a team that can match your size, match Edie's size, when you have Klingon, who's going to be matched up with him, obviously, and that can score in the way that, uh, I don't know, that they... <clears throat> They were in a bit of a shootout at, at certain points with Alabama, um, but you can. But but I don't know if Purdue has necessarily had to deal with that kind of scoring thus far. Yeah, I would say probably Alabama was, I definitely think, a really tough opponent for the Elite Eight. Um, or was it sorry for the final? No, fours. Final Four. For final Four. First because, first appearance for Alabama men's basketball. Because although. UConn really is kind of a juggernaut sort of on both ends. Alabama does has like an insanely potent offense. Totally. So um, I probably I would I would argue potentially more potent in some capacities than Purdue just because they they just have I think more shooting more shooting outlets more um, scoring outlets. But all that being said, my only slight inclination towards Purdue is just this is definitely I've been saying this because I just think it is pretty apparent when you watch them. The Best team I think Zach Eadie's had around him in his career at Purdue, and I'm even saying this with the Jaden Ivey teams. I mm. actually think just the the continued presence of Fletcher Lawyer, who's been there for a while, but then Braden Smith and Lance um, Lance Jones, both of them, both of those guys have been so incredibly important to their success on offense, just being able to knock down shots, which was like always, I think, the issue for the Matt Painter and Zach Eadie teams is just... Edie doing everything, then when he was able to, ha- having to kick it out, guys missing shots. Yeah. However, it would, that, that still has to hold while you're going to be like, 
inevitably sort of smothered by UConn's defense, and you have somebody who can actually match up with Zach Eady. So I I have trouble seeing UConn not winning this game. Yeah, I I, I agree. Um, I, those are our predictions for this evening. Now let's uh, talk about the Milwaukee Bucks just for one second. We uh, look. I, I have been planning I'm happy to talk about the Bucks after the Knicks beat them. Uh, I, yeah, I had been. I had been planning and or thinking. I was like, oh, let's talk about some of the teams that are sliding. Like the Pelicans are a part of it. Know, you know, right. they're not playing great. They've fallen, I think, into the seven seed. Which the Mavs just eliminated the Rockets, I think, from playoff yeah. contention. <laughs> well, yesterday. yeah. I mean, I, I I always thought that there was no shot in hell, right? Like Golden State is currently the ten seed technically, and there's a significant game gap in between right, right. the Rockets and the Warriors. So. So the it, it just depends on it was on, a long shot to begin with. Yeah, it just depends on where people are going to be positioned and if they're going to make the play in or not. And like the Mavericks have been absolutely surging 9 and 1 in their last yeah, 10. Yeah, they've been play. I mean, it's been the the Unfortunately for me as somebody who kind of roots against kind them and the, the Knicks have uh the Mavericks first round pick. But so. I will say I've been impressed all, overall. I was un, I feel like we talked about this a little bit. I was sort of unsure about the PJ Washington mm. trade, but honestly He's been really kind of almost exactly what I feel like they have needed a little bit. And he's come on in a way where I really hadn't seen that as much when he was in Charlotte. Um, and Kyrie Irving is playing out of oh, his yeah, he's mind. Just, I, they, they, I, I just think they found more of an ability to like cohere around Luka. Right. And actually everyone in some way is complimentary of Luka, which even Kyrie, which I think is like very important that they are able to complement each other without sort of kind of devouring each other. Right. And then Washington is just like this lengthy wing who can knock down shots and get and draw fouls in the paint. He's kind of exactly what they need is a little bit of an outlet outside of those two. Right. I mean, and, and it just, it feels a little bit like the cream is rising to the top. Like the Nuggets right. and the Timberwolves feel like they're in the right position at the top totally. of the West. Um, OKC has been a, falling apart a little bit and I expected them. I didn't think that they were going to be out, able to get, you know, uh, to, to see themselves higher than the Wolves or the Nuggets because of just you and inexperience and they're not that big um and it's been a little tough i think because shay and jalen williams both have been out at the same time so it's a lot of like josh giddy chet holmgren like completely relying on those guys yeah who are sort of the guys i feel like will get picked on a little bit in their yes matchups totally when they get to the play i mean and that that's gonna it's specifically for a guy like chet like it's gonna be pretty matchup dependent even though right. you know he's played better than i thought he would give he plays his tough for weight. his size but it's like can you guard LeBron James potentially yeah, for probably like six games right, or seven games, right? Right, like, right. yeah, no, I, I think, you know, it could be interesting to see him match up. Like, uh, I don't know where the Warriors are going to end up getting right. seated, but with a guy like Draymond Even or Right, exactly. Who, like, the, the height never really matters because Draymond is so physical ferocious like, right right exactly yeah, for um sure. and the kings have been faltering as well but we expected that when malik monk went out so right. i just didn't feel like there were a ton of broader storylines coming out of the west but the big thing for me is like the east is boston and everybody else totally. right yeah. and it's frustrating because the east was supposed to be getting back on its feet with some more star power but like the Cleveland Cavaliers are they could have been my other team to crap on here you know Donovan Mitchell has not speaking of guys who have not been the same since they've been injured Donovan Mitchell has not been the same and they have no toughness as a team I mean they they just do not have a mental or physical toughness and that that's I like a prevailing problem it's a huge it, problem it, it, that we've seen over the past few seasons even in the Knicks series last year I feel like we were having the same uh, conversation where it was like getting to that point and then guys like Jared Allen and Evan Mobley were like not really stepping up to needing to kind of be to steal themselves for what it means to be in a play playoff series against a very hungry team and a tough team like the Knicks like the Tom Thibodeau Knicks. yeah and I thought that this stuff about Donovan Mitchell being like soft in the playoffs was kind of BS you know when he was in at Utah but I I don't know. It sort of still continued to rear its head. It's in, continuing. In another, in another yeah. uniform, yeah. And so we'll see. I just have no faith in them. Um, and the Magic, they're tough, but also a young team. So that's they're a pleasant surprise. And, and, and they're right now tied for, I think, I think they're because of some, you know, whatever, maneuvering. They're ahead of the Knicks in the standings. But um, they, have, they defense, have the same record, right. But they're still, I think, sort of like 20, 23rd-ish in offense. So I feel like that's always a tough bargain. That's a we've, tough bargain. I mean, we've, we've, always, we've always said that, too, in the context of like hockey playoffs, too, is like, yeah. 
you it's it's harder to not have offense i feel like than you it is need more margins right right, right right it's 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 you need guys that can make plays and that means and like take scoring. over a little bit right. take over yeah, right 100 yeah, percent. so the other obvious team in the east is the milwaukee i mean is the milwaukee bucks but do yes. you feel better about the Milwaukee Bucks than the New York Knicks without Julius Randle right now, but with OG Ananobi back because the Knicks are 16-3 and with him playing on the team? Well, especially after last night's game, I, I would say I was, I was honestly surprised by A, the deficit at the half, and then the Knicks coming back to win that game. Like, I, it's, it's, it's kind of, there's some cognitive dissonance for me because it's like, I believe in the idea and like the, the, four man group of Brooke Lopez, Giannis, Chris Middleton and Dame. Dame. And I and do. and to be fair to them, you know, right now it's been a bit of a rotation like right. Middleton, Dame, Giannis have not all been really healthy at the same time for a while. Right. But if one of them's out, they should still be pretty good They're and just, they shouldn't be 15 and 17 under Doc that's, Rivers, that's which is just, astounding for this level is, of talent. Right. That's just what I think is surprising is that I feel as if um, that that alone. I know it's only four players, but I actually don't think the team is is constructed that poorly. I think like I think everything for the most part does make sense. I think the issue, unfortunately, now is is that Doc is their coach. Doc is their coach, but also, <laughs> if anything, I think some of the kind of trying to to supplement or make up for some things that are, that feel as if they're lacking come from not having Drew Holiday on the roster. Mm, that's a good point. Like like if anything I'm not certain as as it stands now that like Drew wouldn't necessarily make this team better than maybe someone like Middleton would potentially or so you know what I mean? Like I, I guess I, yeah. in the sense of being a lockdown defender and I guess the only other only counter argument to that is that Drew very much fell apart in the playoffs. Yes, and they and they needed to make room for Damian Lillard. Right, so that right. that that I don't even hate I I don't hate the way the roster is constructed as you're saying, but it feels like Lopez is being like it, used it, it, see, oddly. That's, that's that's I think the worst part. They of don't have toughness or intensity. I mean, defensively, it doesn't feel like they're playing very hard. I mean, they have they they have now lost. How many in a row? Four in a row? Five in a row? And four a few in a row. of them have been to pretty, pretty much cellar-dwelling teams. Okay, so also. they lost to the Knicks. The Knicks are right now the four seed right now. But, I mean, they have lost recently before that to the Wizards. Yeah, who are like literally one of, if not, like maybe the worst team in the league. The Grizzlies, who do not have also, Jaw, also horrible. one of the worst teams in the league. And the Raptors, who horrible. have basically sat everybody and uh, that, that can play they lost 50, basketball. They lost, they lost 15 straight games, I think, prior to that. To the no, no, game. the Raptors are t t t tanking, yeah, right? They like, are like really tanking. in the basement. Yeah. They are really not playing well. So, I mean, they are all significantly below 500 at this point. And so those are the losses that the Bucks had going into the prior Going into the this. postseason. Like, that's, like, I would be, I know some people are, they're saying like some people have been online being like, oh, like, don't take too much from those those losses yet. But I'm like, I don't know, like, I feel like I would want to see them surging prior to yeah. the postseason with a new coach after 30 games as opposed to kind of like scuffling their feet and then losing like games that should not just be gimmies or kind of walks for them, but games that they should maybe be winning by like 30 points. So speaking of 30, when they fired Griffin in January, yeah. they were 30 and 13. Right. Since that point, they have had a losing record since firing Adrian Griffin like with is, Doc Rivers. That is insane. <laughs> they have they have the opportunity to seize that number two seed. And with that opportunity right in front of them, and this is what we say about the horrible record that Doc Rivers, Doc Rivers has in gotta have it games, right. in games to close out series. This is the exact micro example of that leading into the postseason where they could seize this number one, two, number two seed and be set up for the rest of the playoffs. But they're losing to the freaking Raptors and, and the, the Wizards. Wizards and the Grizzlies. Like, and, it's just not and again, sustainable. Yeah, it's not sustainable. And against the Knicks, like... Middleton, uh, Middleton got injured, right? I mean, he got hit in the face, uh, I believe, at at some point during that game. But again, Giannis was in. Giannis was back. Dame was there. What is going on? And the Knicks, like, are not at full strength either. They don't have Julius Randle for the rest of the year. So, I mean, is it crazy to say that in a series between the Milwaukee Bucks and the New York Knicks, I might take the Knicks in, like, seven or something like that? 
Man, I mean, I trust their ability to defend. OG Ananobi was actually, towards the end of the game, giving Giannis Ant Antetokounmpo a lot, of, a lot of grief, like a lot of difficulty. I mean, where is the defense for the Milwaukee Bucks right now, to your point? And, and I think what we were talking about a little bit before the show is it also just seems like certain things that to me that I thought would just be kind of intuitive about the fit of these players together... If you look at some of the metrics throughout the season, the Giannis Dame pick and roll has like not ever really gotten off the ground. It hasn't really fully, it hasn't really come to fruition, which right. to me is kind of shocking because it's like, I would think that that would be something that if I'm them, I'm probably trying to, I'm probably trying to run that like thirty times. Yeah, a game. lean into it because I also feel like even if it gets sort of stifled in any way, there are a number of things that you can then do out of that action. You know, Dame can come back and shoot can shoot from deep. They can kick it to be Malik Beasley or Brooke on the on the on on the perimeter or Middleton on the perimeter. Kick it to Middleton and Middleton can attack a closeout and drive to the hoop. I just feel like there is so much that they could make out of those pick and rolls and they've really not gone to that that much. And then the other thing is speaking of Brooke Lopez Lopez has not really been doing a lot of posting up. He has had a pretty low um, metric of po of post touches, which, as I was saying to you earlier, like Brooke is a good is a good to great three point shooter, but he's also seven feet tall. Yeah. Like give him give him some give him some reps where he's in the post backing a guy up and feed it to him and see what can happen in the in, a, in short area. Like there just do seem to be a, me from my point of view some easy buttons with this team because at the end of the day. Having four guys like Brooke Lopez, Chris Middleton, Giannis, and Dame is a really good four group of four to have. Yeah. It just seems like there are easier solutions to what they're actually putting out there. It it does. They seem lost and it's just confounding to me. I mean, I, I I'm I kind of somewhat root for the Bucks. Like I have a family member that's a Bucks fan, so that's part of why uh, a family member that I like, um, and and so that's kind of why I root for them. Well, I've but, always liked you. I always and truly I've always, liked Giannis. And honestly, I want Dame to finally get a ring know, after yeah, exactly toughing it out for so many years in Portland. But do I do I think that Doc Rivers is the guy to get them over the edge? Absolutely. Um, not sorry absolutely not and um, there aren't honestly many teams where i'd be like oh like they're doc rivers away from like making well, a you deep know, playoff run i because, hated the hire right, i hated right. it from the beginning i can't understand how he keeps getting jobs with that record with the way he acts in the media constantly complaining and bitching and pointing fingers it's I know, he's crazy really, he's he very much likes to like he very much especially recently i would say probably the last like two or three months of like when things get hard especially with this coaching job he's had He's very quick to, like, scapegoat. No, no, no. I mean, I've compared him to Mike McCarthy because it's like, oh, got carried by talent to winning a championship right, and right. seemingly one, can get... One, one championship. One championship right? <laughs> and seemingly gets hired for the rest of his life. But at least Mike, Mike McCarthy doesn't bitch to the media in the way that Doc Rivers right. does. Doc Rivers, like, sometimes I feel like he likes the attention more than he likes actually being a coach. Mike McCarthy pressers, for the most part, are not, like, appointment viewing. Whereas, right. like, Doc gives quotes. Doc is like giving. No, Doc attracts negative head, negative media attention right. to his team. It's like, what is this guy even there for? Right. I don't right. understand, and I just feel for Bucks fans here because you know Dame is not getting any younger too, and this is an opportunity to make a second push for a ring that isn't like a pandemic ring. You know, like right. I, I it's mean, like a full on NBA season. Yes, fans in the stands. Like yes, every like everything like kind of out there like to the, to the regalia of it and like i'm with you it does really bum me out because i would like to see this was the big swing this was like this was the whole thing of like this is what the bucks we are the bucks are putting their chips into the middle of the table and yet still with like maybe i don't know how many games we still have left in the season maybe maybe three to four three to four or maybe five games left in the season to me the ceiling of this Bucks team is still a question mark. Yeah, I th it should. I, I feel like it should have stopped being a question mark in like January. Yeah, you know, no, like, I know. like it should have been like, okay, we know what this is. Like but we understand. Since January, they since Doc took over, I scuffling. can't keep. I keep. I need to keep repeating myself. This team that is the two seed in the East as of right now has a losing record. Yeah, crazy, crazy. Um. All right. Last. Lastly, here, the uh, the Stefan Diggs got traded last week. 
Stefan Diggs got traded to the uh, Houston Crazy. Texans. And, you know, it. I could have seen it coming if I really, you know, wanted to call my shot in the sense that, like, he's been tweeting cryptic things. He's been saying cryptic things. But it's like, is that just Stefan Diggs being Stefan Diggs? It's never good when the wide receiver starts shooting the tweets off. And, and the thing is, is like, I also thought maybe Diggs would take some humble pie and be like, actually, I'm kind of falling off a little bit. I did not have a good playoffs. I dropped a pretty significant pass from Josh Allen uh, in that playoff run that could have won us or at least gotten us closer to, to moving to the Buffalo Bills' first AFC championship under Josh Allen, which is crazy. Um, but, you know, Stefan Diggs is still a really good player, but... He's never been the greatest athlete on the field. You know, he's never been Tyree Kill. He's never been Jamar Chase. You know, these guys that just like when they run or Julio Jones, you look at them and you go, oh, my God, this is a physical, like a physically different player um, than the rest of those guys. Diggs has always been really smart and really, right. you know, a great like route, route runner. running technician. type. Yeah, of he's, yeah, he's just not the physical freak that some of these other guys are. So when he's falling off athletically, I think it's going to start to make itself more noticeable. Um, and apparently he's a bit of a headache, right? And like the Bills are also one of the most cap strapped, have been one of the most cap strapped teams in the NFL. And so they got rid of some, some salary, but I'm pretty sure they retained some of it. Well, there's a big uh, dead, dead money hit. Yeah. Uh, on, uh, from their base, they're basically. I would say I think it's around thirty-ish million dollars paying to have Diggs That's, leave. That must mean he was like actually really pissing them off. Because okay. what are they doing? I mean, I've hated the way the Bills have constructed their roster for years. We've been talking about this on on you know ESPN for a while. Um, but to let him go to, for nothing. To, but to let him go to take on the dead cap and basically get a second round pick out of it. Not even and, this year's second round. So pick. next year, so a twenty twenty five second rounder, that to me means we'll basically get rid of this guy by any means necessary. Yes, we are. We want there to be a. We want there to be a hard reset with the team, but also like a hard reset like without digs. And and they have nobody. Khalil Shakir is like basically almost, almost if I had to guess or I had to kind Curtis of, Samuel's their number one yeah, wide receiver say, who's and be the Khalil number one? Shakir. Shakir or Samuel but I guess it would be Samuel right yeah He's more of an X type and Shakir's more of a slot type yeah and then they have Dalton Kincaid but right. man so this draft I think is going to be almost I would say if I had to if I would if I was to be slightly hyperbolic kind of existential for the B bills for the bills future are they going to trade up like they did with sammy watkins <laughs> remember right. which was a bad trade right it was, right because it just didn't pan out there were right, other so. guys in that trade <clears throat> odell beckham jr yeah, right, who they did right. not take um but well, you're saying maybe oh maybe they trade up for like a one of the top three like like, like adun zia or malik neighbors or something well like malik that. neighbors is not getting out of the top 10 um, there's no, no, no. Oh, yeah. So I guess I'm wondering. I how think Odunze will fall. I mean, I've seen Odunze is not fast. Like, I don't know why you would take a guy like that in the top ten. Not to be, not to be a jerk, but I mean, oh, Odun is a good player. But I've watched. I was just watching some 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 of his stuff, and he doesn't get any separation. Um, like Brian Brian uh, Thomas, Thomas out of LSU. <laughs> Like I would take Brian Thomas over over Odunze any day of the week. Odunze is very polished, but you're right; he's not as like. But 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 that's my yeah. You know, that's not our thing. Yeah, right. No, he's his because whereas Thomas is tall and fast. Thomas is like six. I, Thomas almost plays like a slot player, but he's tall. Brian Thomas ran at the combine, unlike the other guys. Do you want to know what his numbers were? I mean, we're like talking in I like mean, a four four. I don't think Odunze ran. Um, he has four three three, and yeah, he is six three. Yeah, that's crazy. He is six three and ran a four three three. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. Brian uh, Brian Thomas, I think it could be the perfect guy for the Buffalo Bills. But they and if would, he's still there in the middle of the round, maybe as you're saying, maybe trade up for, for that. He's going to be a guy that's taken in the teens, I think. Yeah, yeah, at, I agree. At, I agree. You know, for sure. um, so. I think he's perfect, perfect for them. But Odunze would be more of a Stefan Diggs type, right? Where it's right. like, okay, this he's guy a, can he's run a route routes, technician, right? Yeah. But you have to get him open, right? Um, right. I wish that they would take a flyer on a guy of who is a little bit more has athletic upside. But 
putting the 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 bills aside for one second because i think they're a bit of a dumpster fire and i know it's 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 just tough to see the way forward at this point which makes me sad for josh allen because i'm like a future new york giant i mean yeah, right. <laughs> he's but it, it but it would almost make me wonder because i'm like you these are the prime years of your career like this team might be on the verge of some sort of rebuild like it's not the 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 uh, Giants are trading six overall, and yeah. then their next year's first for Josh Allen. And That's who, just you heard re- reuniting word, him word with Brian Dayball. That's what everyone's <laughs> saying. Um, no, I know. I feel badly for Josh Allen because he's never had the support, and now he's even ha- has less support. And it's also just in, in, in keeping with what happened on the defense too. Like Jordan Poyer gone, Micah Hyde most likely gone, Tre'Davious White Tre'Davious most likely White, gone, another cut. Mitch Morse gone on the offensive line. Ryan Bates gone on the offensive line. Like, which not all of them are equal in terms of like the value. I just more mean like this is a significant shift of like a lot of tur- a lot of turnover, a, a lot, lot of, of turnover. Turn. Yeah. And but on the other hand, to your point, speaking of, I think I'm honestly, I have to, I'm gonna have to maybe over the course of the next few months temper my expectations for the Houston Texans. I think they're going to be awesome. Oh my god! I think they are like they they might be like my new as you, I, I like to take your term. They might be the new my new AFC mistress. Yes, <laughs> yes. Because like Stroud. Can I have two FC, AFC mistresses? Yeah, you, you listen. We, we, I we, mean the we, Buffalo Bills and then the Houston Texans. And I, back in the day before he was a uh, revealed to be a sex pest, I was also a huge Deshaun Watson fan. Right, so right. I'm not coming out I of no, a, nowhere right, with the Texans appreciation. Yeah, yes, um, yeah. But I'm thinking like. Stroud coming into his next year, a healthy offensive line in terms of having Laramie Tunsil, Titus Howard back, Shaq Mason back, Drew Scruggs at center, Diggs, Nico Collins, Tank Dell coming back healthy, Oof. Dalton Schultz. Um, and then on defense, with the line kind of fitted back up with Will Anderson, Danico Autry, Daniil Hunter. Daniil Hunter. And Derek Stingley. And if maybe they can get another corner. I mean, this is lo- like this is looking really, really, really promising. Not just for like making the playoffs, for like making a deep run into the playoffs. Yes, I mean they won a playoff game last year. Let's not forget they beat the Cleveland Browns, and the Cleveland and, Browns are no scrubs on and, defense in particular. Right, and like kicked their ass. Kicked too. their ass after the Browns had kicked their ass right, right. in Houston, I believe. So, um, yeah, I mean C.J. Stroud is he. Stefan Diggs has gone from a few really good quarterback situations. Right. <laughs> um, uh, he's he's gone from Kirk Cousins to Josh uh, Allen to Josh Allen to uh, to CJ Stroud. And this and might be the best one potentially. It he's could the, be the youngest guy who already in his rookie season is looking like maybe I would I would say like top ten ish. Oh yeah, quarterback because their roster. I mean, they have way more flexibility, so and more, they're right. going to be. I mean, in the end. CJ Stroud already, I feel like, is surrounded by better talent than Josh Allen totally. was for most of his career. Totally. He had that one year, you know, when they when they uh, went to the the that duel with the Chiefs for the right, AFC the Championship, two- right, where they looked phenomenal. But for the most part, the Bills have not. The the Bengals, the Chiefs, both of those teams have had better rosters for the entirety of like their franchise quarterback yep, team. I agree. The uh, the the Ravens in in the AFC, and now the Texans. I think like. That trio of receivers I would have taken over, you know. It's a really dynamic Anybody. Group. Right. Right. Because because to your point about Diggs in terms of like with Not anybody, but I mean anybody well, on the Bills during that time. Right. Mm-hmm. But with Diggs, but with D- Diggs I actually think is a great compliment to Tank Dell and Nico Collins in that Nico Collins is a taller field stretcher. He's he's athletic. Whereas Diggs can kind of be like the over the middle route running. Underneath. Guy. And, and under yeah, underneath and then and then Tank Dell has his own route running chops, but is also very fast. Take the top off, and he can do all that trick stuff too. Right, Jet right. sweeps, whatever you they want. They just have a lot of options now. Yes. with Diggs kind of filling out the whole pass catching core. Yeah, I mean, man, are they excited? Oh, it's gonna be so awesome! It's so I wish, I wish fun. we could watch them tomorrow. I know, <laughs> I know. I saw some of those photos of of uh, of Diggs with uh, CJ Stroud. Yeah, they were already working out. I was like, okay, good. At least they're like, uh, they're CJ is smart enough to be like, okay, I must immediately ingratiate myself to Stefan Diggs. Yes. And be yeah. like, you were my best friend. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and CJ is just a hard worker. Everything you hear about him is that he just is tireless. Um, so you can really, you can, uh, uh, I believe it. I believe it. But I do feel badly for the Bills. I think their window, I mean, we I said know. it last year. They they exceeded expectations on the back of Josh Allen. Diggs didn't even perform well at the end of the year, as we said. Um, I literally thought the window was like this year. 
this year and, and I that's thought it, it was going to be like the most open this year and still it just wasn't enough it wasn't enough um and the the texans yeah they didn't even have to give up their second round pick this year because they traded they have two seconds I, I thought it was a weird a kind of questionable trade um i guess maybe they didn't like guys that are going to be at the back half of the the first round but they traded out of the first round and gave number 23 to the the minnesota vikings so um that's that's part of why you know the vikings are probably going to try to move up to to jump the giants or something to take a quarterback but um we'll be doing a mock draft oh, soon so exciting not that soon but soon this has been not a fun draft season for me i i, I normally get so into it get really excited but the fact that there's so much uncertainty about what the Giants are going to do at quarterback makes me want to like makes me feel sick. Like I just it, that that's too too much anxiety of the things I can't control and don't know what's happening. This is also I would say it's and and not to not to rub in your anxiety more. I more just mean like yeah, I understand it because like this is a pretty volatile Draft. QB carousel. Oh of, yeah, like, like I feel like even with some of the other ones where there were this many kind of like options at the in the top ten for quarterback. It was still sort of more established. This I'm like, I actually after Caleb Williams, like I don't really know exactly how these things will shake out, and also not only how they'll shake out in terms of selection, but who's actually going to be doing the choosing. Well, I mean, I think that it's becoming clear that these concerns about Drake May are like he's not going to be the second overall pick. I can't think. I mean, every person I'm hearing who's actually listening to the film, the guys at the Athletic. Chris Sims over at NBC, who's my guy, and I was listening to a Giants podcast the other day, I'm talking Giants, they go through the film, there's some issues. There are issues with Drake May, and it's his pro day was not good, and I watch, I watch that pro day, and it's like, his the balls that he throws are not very impressive. Like, J.J. McCarthy's spirals look like a machine, and I was not high on J.J. McCarthy going into this year. Michael Penix is that dude. He had the best pro day maybe of all of them. Yeah, there were some pretty cool throws with Penix. Oh my gosh, he looks phenomenal. But he's like, that's the kind of guy that I like, right? Where it's just the, the, the arm talent is incredible. I don't really think Drake, Drake May is an improviser, but it doesn't seem like his arm is that talented. Yeah. And he, his mechanics are off. He reminds me a little bit in terms of, and I, and I say this as like slightly differing because it's not the same level he's not the same level of prospect in my view but of some of his like over the middle and kind of like intermediate stuff is sort of like trevor lawrence e and also his like frame is sort of he's like a big he's a big guy yeah but like lawrence is not known for like i would say like as much of like he doesn't have like an insane deep ball like this crazy like cannon of an arm like josh allen or even or mahomes does trevor and, lawrence's arm looks better than drake no no i agree but I, I, yeah. i'm not even i'm not even doing a one-to-one -one because i think trevor yeah. is just ultimately more talented may where i think is a pro is a problem is that while not being as i think athletically gifted as josh allen has some of josh allen's like chaos tendencies yeah like less to sort of back it up i think when he's in in rhythm and in and has like a clean pocket and also when he, there's like design runs from he does look pretty good but i just think there's like for me i just think there are like it's, there are home run swings to take and i think Penix to me is more of like a well i would take that swing maybe not at second overall i'm just saying i would maybe even wait for Penix. Yes, in a way, people are gonna be there. I think the first two guys, like Jaden Daniels, should go to the Commanders if they know what's good for them. I mean, that's the kind of guy that I don't know. I saw his pro day, and his spirals look phenomenal. Like the way he throws the football, I was shocked at how awesome he looks throwing the football. And then you put the athletic ability on top of it. The one question is his size. I'm just so, and also he is like. He gets hit like he's in Tom and Jerry. I know, like, I know. But, like, you know, I, I, I'm I trying to scout myself because I liked Lamar Jackson coming out in the draft, but I was like, you know, I'm gonna, I was huge on Josh Allen because of his size, right? Like, Lamar, I thought, looked a little skinny. But then, you, you know, the, he comes into the league. The one thing is that Jaden Daniels is not that young, so he has less right. of an opportunity in, to put on muscle. He's been in college for a while at this point because he started at Arizona State and mm -hmm. went to LSU, but... No, I agree with you. The, the, the athleticism is crazy with with Jaden. It, it it's more can he put on more mass? Yeah, and can maybe he be coached out of the like 
if he could be coached out of the instead of throwing the ball away or sliding or checking down or whatever, not like trying to like backflip over the line to get like helicoptered by three guys. If that's just sort of like a, oh like I'm becoming a professional football player, that's gonna I'm gonna stop that tendency. That's huge. I'd rather take the the gamble on being able to coach that so you can get yeah. all of this other incredible. Like Cuz he really is a, he's he's a he's a pretty unbelievable runner. Like he's I, I, I really underestimated fast. it. I underestimated it. I underestimated how how strong of a thrower he is. So this is what I'm long story short what I'm saying is is like I agree Caleb Williams stands above the rest. I really like Jaden Daniels more than I thought I did. I like him and Penix a lot. I like J.J. McCarthy more than I thought I would. Um, I thought similarly, too. Yeah. When you see how, oh, wait, he's 21 and will put on muscle, looks like the kind of body that can put on muscle, and throws it way better than I thought and is a good athlete. Yeah, like, the age is encouraging for McCarthy. Yes. That he's, a, he's a young guy. Like, yeah. He's not, he's not, you could definitely argue, like, oh, like, I'm not, he's not in the ceiling because he's not 24. The like, guys you know, that I don't feel excited about are Drake May and Bo Nix. Like I don't really get what people are talking about with Bo Nix. Like people, there's no, no, there's I, some Bo, there's Bo to me is like a high end backup. That I I don't. Some people are talking about him in the first round. I'm maybe I need to see more, but I I watched the Oregon Washington game and it, it looked like two different guys. So I'm not seeing, you know, like my guy again. I listen to Chris Sims and, and P, he loves Bo Nix. I I don't understand. That. No, no. I think I think if a team is desperate in the first round, they'll take they'll take Bo Nix in the first round. But I would honestly, if he if he went in the third round, I'd be like, that's he's also fine. older, you know, and and like uh, he's also I think twenty four or something like twenty three. Yeah, he is. Whatever. Yeah. Like um, of those guys, to me, it seems like incredibly clear that Penix is more talented. But but all that is to say, I guess I'm just fascinated. Like if if ultimately May is not the second, I'm curious what whether. What I'm telling of, you now, I don't think he will be. So if it's, but it, so if it's, if it's, let's say, just for example, it's, it's one and two is uh, Caleb and Jaden. Mm -hmm. That's when it gets. Really I'm, very I'm curious who will want to then trade up to be like, oh, like maybe we didn't think Drake May was going to be there. Maybe we didn't think like, and then also, if if someone else wants to go for that, JJ McCarthy still left. Like, should we start trying trade up? Like, I'm just curious how much of like the arms race starts after the second pick. I would not be shocked if the New England Patriots and the Minnesota Vikings already have a trade in place for those two first round picks that we don't know about. I would not be shocked if the Giants have a trade in place. You know, the Giants have deep organizational ties and connections with the Patriots. Right. But I would also not be shocked if the Patriots took a quarterback at three. I think it's a mistake. I really do, given the state of their roster. I think that they need so much that no matter who they throw in there, it's going to be setting them up for failure. Um, but that's like really where the draft starts. And then, you know, maybe, maybe the Cardinals, like if the Patriots, uh, you know, say like take Joe Alt or something like that. Right. I mean, it, it could, the Patriots are the, the team I don't have a feel for. So, um, yeah, anyway, but, uh, we'll do a mock draft at some point. I just, I just am not, I'm feeling, I, I you're starting to see Drake Mays fall into like 11 and some mock drafts. And to me, that's what that indicates is the guys that, do all this draft analysis, they're hearing from teams they don't like what they see. So, with that said, we'll read some IMs and get out of here. I know. Uh, you good? Do you need a glass of water? Yeah, I, I, I'm losing my voice. Okay, just do a one shot for me and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. And I'll just read some of these IMs because I forgot to last week. Um, <coughs> Kowalski from Nebraska. My nine and five year old nieces were ex running around excited yesterday after Iowa lost. The celebration is not at the expense of any individual. But against the state of Iowa, as everyone in our family is raised at a young age to hate the state of Iowa and make fun of all of its people. May an eternal eclipse forever hang over the people of Iowa. Much love and left is best. Thank you, Kowalski. Um, Tim Notpool said, Stolke is really good, but the Iowa bench scored zero points. Yeah, it was incredibly apparent. Um, I don't even know if the bench got on the floor. Like, I would need to look back on it more uh De in more detail but yeah it was pretty clear that they did not feel comfortable playing their bench against south carolina <clears throat> steve cj says caitlin clark had never been full court pressed for the entire season and she would take a shot from behind the arc before trying to drive it in everyone kept saying that you have to guard iowa's entire team but no team did that in the season yeah south carolina did dan from columbus said clark and the two starters played uh and two other starters played 40 minutes wow so the entire game the Iowa bench only had two players get 
time for a combined 18 minutes. By contrast, the USC bench had four players combined for 75 minutes. Um, Sunburned Boomer says, I live in Iowa City. Nike hung a couple of multi-story Caitlin uh, banners on our downtown parking ramps. She's got cardboard cutouts in our grocery stores. Look, she's a great player and set great records. She's got her cash grab deals and is heading to the WNBA. I feel our community support for the women's basketball program, program is going to dry up over the next couple of years in her absence. I mean, that may be the case, but this is about, like, r- the rising tide for everybody. And I think it's undoubtedly true that there's going to be more interest in women's basketball, regardless of when she, you know, when she, when she graduates, it's going to be tough. But there will be, there's always, an, there's always the next guy, you know, <laughs> Peyton Manning retired, Patrick Mahomes came around. You know, I mean, that's just the kind of thing that 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 that's how this stuff works. Um, they the they the Emma Viglin said, did either of you play sports in high school and college? Yes, I did not play. I'm not in college. Um, I played some tennis. I played basketball. I played softball in high school. Just a little bit. I wasn't super good, partly because um, I didn't try. I don't. I have deep regrets about that. I think. You know, just I had insecurity about not being immediately good at something. Um, And I could have been much better if I had really just like committed to it. But I was just like kind of insecure and moody and also a bit of a late bloomer. And then I ended up just at that point, I was really into reading and writing and not that much into sports. And I got really into sports my senior year of high school, mostly uh, junior and senior year. (laughs) Um, I ran cross country interestingly enough mostly because my friends did it i was yeah. very bad <laughs> i was one of the worst runners okay but i well, was mostly there for moral support yeah but you and play it, golf i play golf and i play tennis not in like like uh, uh organizational tennis i mean like i just play for fun yeah yeah um mike from texas says sorry to burst your texans love bubble but jaguars are going to rule afc south duval love y'all it left is best mm-hmm. Tater Tots says apparently they restructured Dix's contract to move some money for next year into this year, so he'll hit free agency after this upcoming season. So Houston should get a motivated Diggs. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that that was part of the condition. The rest of his contract seemed like basically non-guaranteed for the most part. Um, Dan from Columbus said, just saw an article posted four hours ago on CBS Sports that the NAIA has banned trans women from participating in women's sports. And looks like trans men have started taking hormones to inform the NAIA uh, NAIA National Office and participate in man, men's sports. The article also mentions that the NAIA president say the organization has no knowledge of transgender athletes competing in its postseason to this point. Dan, I'm going to have to look more into that. Um, now from Trinidad, Emma and Bradley, what is your opinion on Ice Cube offering Caitlin $5 million to play on big three sports tournament after the summer? Um, stupid. Uh, I, I don't know. She should go to the WNBA. <laughs> And the final I am of the day. Um, do, do, do. Sunburnt Boomer. I live in Iowa City. Nike hung a couple of multi-story Caitlin Banner. Oh, I read that already. Um, the final I am of the day. J-Man Rap says, hey guys, I hope everything is all right between you two. Devils and the Rangers got ugly, but we need to be understanding. Anyway, I'm Jack City for the playoffs, especially NHL. It'll be very fun. I can't even begin to talk about the Rangers without getting very anxious. All right, we will see you next Monday. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.